And we like to think of going from the raw milk to having a cheese with a rind completely covered in microbes as a microbial superhighway. And along the way, there are on-ramps during the cheese making process where microbes can come in and ultimately make it to the final destination, which is the rind. I'm Benjamin Wolf, and I'm a postdoc at Harvard working with Rachel Dutton in the Center for Systems Biology. And what we're doing is we're using these multi-species communities on cheese to actually learn how microbes act when they live together. This is all pure sheet milk, yes. So this particular cheese is called Shepherdista. It's all raw milk cheese. We mainly make raw milk cheese. And it's a natural wine, so we just let whatever is in the air and in the environment grow. I don't fight it, I don't inoculate the milk with any particular molds or ripening agents, just whatever shows up, shows up. So the first on-ramp, or the first way microbes can get into the system, is through the milk. The raw milk is alive, it's packed full of bacteria and yeast. You can sterilize the milk, so you can pasteurize it, and that should kill most of the things that are there. But if you're making a raw milk cheese, you keep those microbes in. Uh, what some cheesemakers do is, in a very controlled way, they add what are known as starter cultures. The first set of microbes that are really important in the cheesemaking process are the lactic acid bacteria. So these are acid-producing bacteria that help with the coagulation of the milk and the formation of the curds. Well, my name is Michael Pollan, and I'm a writer, and I write a lot about food and agriculture. And for my most recent project, I was uh, exploring the, the four principal transformations that we call cooking. You have several different kinds of cooking that involve heat, and then you have this one remarkable, mysterious kind of cooking that's called fermentation, which is cooking without the use of any heat whatsoever, but using microbes basically in place of heat. Well, a lot of the cheesemakers that I interviewed in the course of my research uh, talked about their their sense of wonder and awe that even after years of doing this ne doesn't necessarily go away, but the sense of, of wonder at the process of, of curdling in particular, where a vat of milk, fresh milk, heated up with just a few teeny microscopic organisms stirred into it, it goes from one moment to the next, from a liquid to a mass that's like custard. It just coagulates, it just sort of becomes firm. My name is Heather Paxson and I am a professor of anthropology at MIT. So early on when the cheeses are really young, in particular the, the wash drying cheeses, they're very plain. They're just, they smell like acid, milk, they just, they're very mild, very bland, totally not exciting. And then the final stage of the ripening along this superhighway is when you put the cheese into an aging environment. So you've made the cheese, you form the cheese, you salted the cheese, and now you age it in some kind of cool, usually damp place. And usually those places are caves, and they're packed full of microbes, and they'll colonize the surface of the rind as well. Then after three or four weeks, we start to notice a change. It'll get more and more robust, it'll get more pigmented, and at the same time this is happening, you can start to smell it. And it starts to get a little funk, a little sulfury notes. I talked in my writing about the poverty of our vocabulary around cheese, which is probably about repression. I mean, that we don't want to talk about this, but, but there are, you know, there are reminders of the body, obviously, of, of body odor and of various parts of the body. And, and, um, and I think that we're both attracted and repulsed at the same time. Yeah, it yeah. smells like feet. <laughs> There's been really great recent work on the microbiome of people's feet, looking at both the bacteria and the fungi. And if you look at that data and you put our cheese data right next to it, they look pretty much the same. Well, one of the most striking things that I learned in, in all of my research about cheese is that the specific microbes on a wash brine cheese, a Brevi bacterium, a linens, is very closely related to another Brevi bacterium. Uh, which is common on feet and on the human skin. So it's no wonder. I mean, it's not metaphorical. You know, I've heard people say um, certain cheeses smell like, like stinky socks, or it can be associated with many unpleasant aromas. But I, I guess I try to think more positive in the context of cheese, you know, that stinky is good. So um, to me, it's funky. There's like, you know, there's funky good and there's funky bad. Cheese is funky good. Microbes do not come attached with the labels good and bad. It really is more about the microbial environments that are conducive or less conducive to the flourishing of the bugs that we don't want. And the more I've learned about this, the more first respect I have for the microbes that inhabit me. I think people are grossed out by that because we've become 
a microphobic society that thinks that we need to kill all the microbes in our environment and rid ourselves of microbes. But through the Human Microbiome Project and all these other projects that are turning on light switches and showing us that we're covered in microbes and they're doing very good things for us, um, I think that people are changing their views of microbes. You know, there are bacteria that make us sick and there are bacteria that can kill you. Um, so it would be a little, you know, too liberal to say they're not bad. <laughs> but, but we're learning more and more that it has to do with uh, that, that there's an ecosystem understanding of health and that a bad bacteria in one context might be perfectly good in another. In my 2008 article, I used the term post-pasteurian rather than anti-pasteurianism, precisely because the cheesemakers I saw working with ambient microorganisms um, and raw milk um, are not cavalier about the, p the, the potential of pathogens to get into their cheese. Has it changed my attitude? It's definitely made me um, more relaxed about soil, especially, and um, bacteria in my life. And I mean, I still, you know, I'm careful not to, if I put raw chicken on a cutting board, I, I you know, clean it very carefully. They take after pasteurianism in being very careful about hygiene and taking very seriously microbial risk. They just are moving beyond the pasteurian view of pasteurization and sanitization and standardization and laboratory conditions as the only way of moving forward to return to some of the traditional methods of creating a safe fermented food. You know, I'm the kind of person that will eat anything at least once, and if I like it, I'll eat it again. I, I fear nothing. You can't really tell that there's microbes all over here, but when you put them on cheese, it's like you're photocopying up that microbiome that you have, making it super obvious to you, which I think shows this direct connection to you as an individual, and then this invisible, otherwise invisible world that you're amplifying up for people to see, which I think is a very useful tool. Make a cheese that was inspired by me or my bacteria. I would love it to be something that's flavorful and a little bit funky. I don't think it's overly stinky. I would probably be a little fluffy, squishy, soft one. <laughs> but as least processed as possible. Do you think that you would try um, a cheese made out, like made on purpose, out of bacteria sampled from a person's skin? Oh, I would. But I bet a lot of people would think that was way too gross. <laughs> but I say bring it on, and if it tastes good, I'll eat more.